after that presentation, we're going to continue with Mally Fowl and let's call up Dr. Mally Fowl himself, Joe Benishimish from the National Mally Fowl Recovery Team to share science, data and learnings. And he's also coming to us virtually. Dr. Mally Fowl online? He's not online yet. <laughs> yes, I am. Yes, I oh, am. Oh, he's there. <laughs> Hello. There he is. <laughs> All hands together, please, for Dr. Mellifow. Thank you very much. Um, I gather you've just actually met me. I came in before, I had to pop out very quickly, I guess when Liz was giving her, um, her introduction and I came back to see myself on the screen. It was a bit... A bit, a bit strange. I've never been in the situation before where I've stolen my own thunder. But not to worry. Let's share the screen. Can you see? Sorry. Firstly, can you hear me? Hello? Sorry, Joe. Yes, we can hear you. We just realised that you can't hear us. So apologies. That's okay. Good. All right. Well, um, thank you very much. Firstly, I'd like to pay my respects to Aboriginal elders, past and present, and elders of other communities who might be here, and also to, you know, I'm here down, of course, in Melbourne in lockdown in uh, Wurundjeri country. So pay my respects to Wurundjeri elders as well. And thank you to the organisers, especially Kane, for inviting me to provide this overview. Now, I'm just going to speak very broadly about the science, but of course, you can't really talk without, about Malifar without mentioning its extraordinary behaviour. And I just want to make the point of how utterly unique this bird is on the, on the planet. Um, there are about 20 different species of megapodes of seven sort of general types, but our Malifowl is the only one that has cracked, you know, an arid environment. And it does that by being extremely sophisticated and, uh, and, and pretty tough. I just intend to give a broad overview of some of the science. I just thought I might uh, put up this slide quickly of some of the, the, the major you know, contributions, both going way back to the early days of Harry Frith and John uh, Brickhill and David Booth, uh, through the 90s when, when I started and Dave Pradell and Rob Wheeler with their, with their work, uh, Blair Parsons, of course, in, in WA, and you know, a whole lot of other people um, who have contributed to the science. And current, you know, and, and also to the, the current researchers, we're going to hear from Jessica fairly soon, but there are a number of others. There's Alice Young, Perry Stenhouse, and a couple of others that I'll be mentioning along the way. But mostly I'll just be gleaning some of the findings uh, to provide or try to provide a bit of an overall perspective. A few points about Malifowl that uh, I expect most of you know, but I, I, it's worth repeating. Firstly, they're, they're, they're long lived. They suffer very, very high mortality when they're young. But once they get to breeding age, it seems that they are, um, you know, they'll, they'll persist, you know, breeding for, for 20 years, possibly more. Um, they have very high fecundity. They're pumping out lots of eggs almost every year. And most of those eggs actually hatch. It's the young that suffer the very high mortality. Um, they tend to be sedentary and they're, they're monogam monogamous in the sense that they are socially monogamous, um, but exactly what they do when no one's watching is another question. They have a very broad diet, which makes diet studies actually very, very difficult. Um, Think of them as, as, as chooks, basically. They'll eat just about anything. Uh, they rarely fly, but they're great walkers. 
they always roost in trees, even the chicks. It's something that all Mallee fowl, you know, get off the ground at night as soon as they possibly can. And they rely on their wariness, their incredible, you know, alertness of what's going on around them and cryptic behaviour to avoid predators. And unfortunately, they're also nationally vulnerable and considered to be endangered in most states. Despite the really peculiar nature of breeding system of Malifaux, they occupied a vast expanse across Australia. So, you know, particularly widespread in Mallee and in acacia uh, shrublands. But of course, now, you know, the range has shrunk a little bit. This little map that I'm showing up here is, is showing what we think of as the historical range of Malifaux. Um, and it's made up of lots of, of sightings, sightings from, you know, from museums to, um, you know, Birds Australia, wildlife surveys, all sorts of things, museum records, to give us a bit of a picture of, you know, where things are at. Now, I suspect that Brett might be feeling a little uncomfortable now because his sights aren't being shown in this. And that's because this is actually quite an old map. So I apologize for that. Since then, we've got Malifowl through here at, uh, in um, the Maralinga lands. Joe. And I think, sorry? Sorry to interrupt you, Joe. We can't see yeah. your slides just yet. You can't see my slide. Did you see the ones before? No, <laughs> no, we haven't. So we're just wondering. Yeah. Have you me. not seen any of my wonderful slides? I'm sorry, no. <laughs> well, that's all Doesn't right, can we fix it? You can fit, there's definitely fit the slides in. Everyone's following and everyone's very, very engaged. I don't know if you can see us in that screen, but we are completely engaged. I didn't want to interrupt you, but we'd like to see. Well, I'm glad you did. Um, of course, Joe. Oh, yes, we've got them. Oh, look, all I can say is, gee, you missed some, some, some great slides, but so it goes. Thanks. How Joe. about I go back one at least? Yes, please do. Thank you. Okay, so that was the ecology section. And um, I don't think you missed much more. It was just a list of various people. Um, cute little chick down the bottom there. All right, so we're up to date. Thank you for letting me know. Would have been worse if it was right at the end. All right, so that's the historical range made up of a whole lot of dots. Apologies to, to Brett that there are no dots in here. We just haven't really, you know, uh, collected all that information in the last few years. So this map is really up, only up to 2005. Okay, and here's the range again. And this time I'm just showing, these are all our monitoring sites that Michael explained before. So fairly comprehensive. I'm having a little bit of trouble with the mouse now too. Oh, okay, so the historical sightings uh, provide a, uh, an insight into the range of the species. And what I wanted to show here was how the range is actually mostly intact. If you look at the, in this particular slide, we have the most recent uh, Malifaux records in each one degree grid cell across Australia. Uh, now this is also only up until about 2005, but it, it, it doesn't matter for the point that I want to make. And that is that they, the range of Malifaux is, is pretty much intact. And this is really quite different from the pattern that we see in medium sized mammals. Um, I've already mentioned that uh, Brett Backhouse's sites in the Maralinga lands aren't shown. That should really, whoops, sorry, that should all be blue in there. And I believe that uh, Catherine Sinclair will be talking later about points in here. So the range is mostly intact and that, that in itself is, is, is pretty interesting. In 
In order to establish trends, however, we have to look at individual sites and see how they're tracking over time. And we do this with the monitoring that uh, Michael spoke about. When we crunch the data, as we have, what we see is, is a, a series of declines, particularly in South Australia and in Western Australia. Um, in this graph on the, um, on the right, you can see the trend here. Down below are the number of sites involved. And obviously the more sites involved, uh, the more confident we are about these trends. Uh, and the gray shaded area are standard errors. So we're very confident, unfortunately, that there have been some pretty serious declines. Worst of all, actually, in South Australia. Um, the other point I wanted to make here is, is also one that Michael made, and that is how important citizen science, uh, scientists are in establishing this data. Um, and you know, we, we, we recognize them, we, we, we honor them, they are the backbone very much of so much of the Mallee fowl conservation work across Australia. This graph alone is for all of Australia and it's based on uh, 70, or or 70 to 80,000 mound records over the last 30 or so years and a few very old historical records. Um, it's an extraordinary achievement by our citizen scientists. About the threats, how can we explain some of these, um, these trends that we're seeing? We're still struggling to, unfortunately. I'm gonna go through each of these um, quite briefly and, and, and try and um, distill, I suppose, the most important messages. So clearing, predation, grazing, fire, fragmentation, and climate change. You've seen all of them before because it's pretty common for threatened species. So the first one is, is, is clearing and habitat loss. Um, this is basically, you know, this, this is mostly historical, thank goodness, although there is still clearing going on in some states, uh, particularly in New South Wales. And that incremental clearing is, 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 is very serious, I think. Uh, and, and unforgivable in this, you know, in the, in the 2000s. First point I wanna make is that the best malleafowl habitat has, much of it has already been cleared for agriculture. Um, and we see that because the remnants often have the very highest, even now, the very highest mound densities. And what it's done is it's, it's cut the landscape up into tiny little fragments. Um, and theory tells us that the, the future for those fragments is, is pretty grim. Nonetheless, there's, there's still you know, a lot of country, I guess, that is less arable and still occupied um, by Malleafowl. To give you a bit of an example is, you know, um, I guess you're up here, sorry, up here in, in Geraldton and, and Perth is here. So this is Southwest Western Australia. These are all the historical records. Once again, only up to 2005, apologies for that. And this outline shows the, you know, the, the estimated range of Malleafowl uh, pre-European. Take a look at the, the concentration all through here of, of sightings. Um, and what's left there now? I mean, that's basically what we're dealing with. Clearing has been a huge factor in Malleafowl decline. Um, and this is an area where on those range graphs, as, as you know, it was all kind of blue. So the, the birds are still here, um, but, you know, in tiny little cut up areas. And that's once again, just to show you the distribution of our monitoring sites. If you focus just down here, look at all of our monitoring sites down here. Some of these go back to the days of the Malleafowl Preservation Group. You keep looking, that's what it looks like from space. They're just tiny little fragments.
So that's the first point, is clearing has been devastating. The next thing I'd like to talk about is uh, predation. And that has been a very vexed issue for a number of years. Key work by Harry Frith and Pradell and Wheeler, and more recently by uh, myself and um, Darren Southwell, and Jessica Walsh as well from Queensland, uh, did a lot of analyses on these. In summary, we know that Mallee fowl um, are predated by foxes. Foxes eat Mallee fowl at all stages of their lives. Um, and it's been, they've been, foxes have been considered a major threat really since the 1990s um, through Pradell and Wheeler's uh, work. But what we're finding in the long-term monitoring, um, you know, monitoring both Mallee fowl and for that matter, Mallee, uh, foxes by their scats, what we see is that while baiting reduces fox abundance uh, quite significantly, it doesn't seem to raise breeding numbers, even after many, many years. In fact, what we see in a lot of places is a positive association between fox abundance and mallee fowl. The places where we have the most mallee fowl, at least in Victoria, often have the most foxes, which is an odd one, isn't it? So we're sort of, you know, unsure about the fox situation. It, it, it is certainly not a clear benefit as we had hoped. Nonetheless, we're certainly recommending that baiting um, is undertaken whenever captive reared mallee fowl are released because of course captive reared birds are pretty naive. With cats we don't know very much at all unfortunately. Uh, cats are very elusive but at least in the Victorian mallee they seem to be quite rare as I'll show you later. Um, they're nonetheless quite quite a concern. So the question is, is the red fox a red herring? Um, this is a very important question because if it is, you know, if fox baiting doesn't really help mallee fowl, then it's a great distraction and we should be putting our effort into other actions. Um, on the other hand, it's relatively easy to bait um, and it's very, it's relatively easy to reduce fox numbers. So if there's any value at all in that management lever, we really want to know. So in order to do that, um, we started the Adaptive Management Predator Experiment, the AMPE that Michael talked about. And I believe Jessica might be filling in some details about that a bit later as well. At least her excellent work that's involved in it. I'll go through this, I think, quite quickly because uh, Michael has already gone through it. But the, the bottom line is we map the mounds and uh, we monitor the breeding numbers, mostly by citizen scientists. We put out camera traps in order to monitor uh, both predators and competitors. And then management comes along and attempts to reduce the predators in one area um, and leave them alone in another. And, and in that way, we, we hope to be able to see a difference. So what, you know, the, I think the, the AMPE is really very ambitious. It's trying to do a few different things. Um, firstly, we want to be able to see that the predator, you know, the baiting, for example, um, is having an effect on predators. Um, and then if it is having an effect on predators, we want to understand, you know, what the response is by Mallee fowl. But there are also secondary effects of baiting um, because, you know, you take out the foxes and you may increase some of the, the herbivores. Um, and so that's another factor. And so, you know, the intention here is to try and unravel some of these you know, complicated factors. And the design uh, also talked about uh, a bit by Michael is really just a replicated design across the country um, with lots of different partners uh, from Bush Heritage and AWC to a number of NRM agencies. 
and it's ambitious and it's big in scale, uh, but it's very, very important. And we're really hoping to understand this whole relationship between uh, foxes in particular, but also cats and mallee fowl uh, much better. Michael actually had a much better example of the, uh, the sites around Australia because this one's quite incomplete. Um, but I did want to point out Cindy Howes's um, uh, paper with, with Darren Southwell and, and a number of others uh, describing the experiment if anybody wants to know a lot more about it. So the, the upshot there is that we really just have to clarify what this baiting is doing and whether it is in fact useful. Next threat I'd like to talk about, of course, is grazing. And this is actually more difficult than foxes because it's harder to do an experimental uh, type arrangement. Frith was the first to really identify stock grazing as a major threat to, to mallee fowl. And the issue here is that they eat the food of mallee fowl and in time they can also degrade habitat and completely change it by eating the young seedlings of shrubs and what have you. Feral goats and kangaroos are probably a major concern that we have, uh, but it's very, very difficult to get numbers. Um, camera traps are starting to provide some of these data, but of course we don't have this data going back for 30 years as we do with the Mallee Farm monitoring. It's, it's much more recent. And, you know, we don't have cameras in all our sites either. To give you some examples here, um, this is, these are some of the results from um, continuous camera trapping at six sites in Victoria over three years. We collected over 200,000 photos and it was mostly volunteers once again who, who made a major contribution by helping us sort through all those photos. I want to draw your attention to really grey kangaroos in this example and, and to mallee fowl. Quite extraordinary numbers of, of kangaroos in our mallee fowl areas. Um, and you might also see that the, um, the foxes, we get huge numbers of foxes too. Most of these areas, mallee fowl numbers are actually quite stable. Um, And then down the list, it, it sort of goes down through, we, we get some goats, but not huge numbers. Um, and very, very, very few cats. Where are cats? There, there are cats. Very, very few cats. Which surprised us all, I think. Um, where I want to draw your attention to is really the macropods and the goats once again. This is, this is a, a heat map that might require a bit of explanation. Um, obviously up the top we have the different months and the sites are arranged down here. And for each site, the different years that we were, we were monitoring that site with the cameras. And what it's showing is where macropods in this case, um, for each line, um, it's, it's a ranking. Each line shows, you know, one year and a ranking of where the mac, you know, in, in which month the macropods were most abundant, grading through from red, that's most abundant, grading through to green, least abundant. And the point I want to make here is how kangaroos are moving into the Mallee um, during the winter. And this is precisely when mallee fowl are depending on, um, on herbs and, and green tips to, um, to feed. They're mostly herbivorous during this time, eating, well, quite a few weeds actually, but you know, everything from orchids to um, fringe lilies and uh, all sorts of different things, mostly herbs. So it's quite concerning to see that the, the macropods are actually moving in. Not only are they extremely commonly seen on our cameras, but they're increasingly so during the, um, during the winter. 
And if we combine, you know, the abundance and the seasonal patterns and also the size differences, just to really kind of ram home this point, in this graph, what I'm trying to show is a kilogram for kilogram comparison of Mallee fowl with others. So for example, you know, for each, here in January, for each kilogram of Mallee fowl out there, there's something like 50 kilograms of macropods. This is from the camera trapping data. But during the winter, when Mallee fowl are mostly eating the green tip um, and are most likely to compete with herbivores, we're getting figures of, you know, between 100 and 200 kilograms of herbivore for each kilogram of Mallee fowl. So my point here is really that there is plenty of scope for competition and we're very concerned about it. I can see time is flipping away very quickly, so I'm going to have to speed up. Fire is another big concern. Um, Mallee fowl, of course, fire is part of the Mallee ecology. I, you know, um, it, it's, it, it's integral to Mallee, Mallee ecology. But Mallee fowl tend not to like country. They don't, uh, burnt country. They tend not to breed in burnt country for at least 10 years. And they're very, very rare in terms of breeding for at least 20. Um, on the positive, they do seem to be able to persist even in very small remnants. Um, but the major point here is that big fires kill Mallee fowl and render the habitat, you know, unsuitable really for 10 to 20 years. And fires of 100,000 hectares are not unusual these days in the Mallee. And unfortunately, they're likely to become much more frequent there and more intense and bigger with climate change. So time is running out. I don't think I will, I think I'll skip a few slides, but I will point out, uh, this is a graph from uh, Jemima Connell's work in 2017, based on sightings um, of Mallee fowl in different age country, and, and the paper is down here. The point I wanna make is really that it's these, these areas in here that I think everyone would agree that are, are best for Mallee fowl. Um, the actual responses will change for different habitats. Um, certainly what we tend to see is the breeding continues in older country, slightly different habitat from what Jemima was looking at. Um, and that's a point that Blair Parsons has made previously that, you know, the, uh, the different habitats respond very differently to fire and we should expect different uh, responses from Mallee fire. Moving on, um, fragmentation is a very, uh, you know, a, a, a great concern. Uh, I think Tony Friend in particular was talking about, um, you know, the um, stochasticity, the, the, you know, when things, when numbers are low, how things can go extinct very easily. Um, and also we have the problem of inbreeding and gene flow. However, what we've found in our analysis of monitoring data is that Mallee fowl actually do very well in the small patches. Um, so we shouldn't really give up on the small patches. The, um, we won't have time to go into it, but the effect size is, is very strong. We suspect we know why, and that is probably that it's better country that is cut up. Whereas, you know, the, the poorer country is uh, usually not cut up. Nonetheless, it, so, it shows how resilient and resourceful these birds are and how adaptable they are, which was, of course, a point that uh, Brett was making about, you know, the trains. So it's great that they can persist in fragmented landscapes, but theory tells us, I think, very clearly that this resilience will not last. So remediation is absolutely necessary. Um, I think we're all fans of habitat linkages and there are a number of groups who are, um, you know, uh, very active in this space. Uh, the shout out I wanna make is really for, you know, that we should be considering genetic rescue in some of these small patches as well, uh, particularly where linkages are not feasible 
um, so that we can, you know, sort of keep the genetic diversity up in these small patches. And really, Malifowl is perfect for this. Uh, we simply need to move eggs around from, uh, you know, mound to mound. Now, uh, this is actually, you know, there is a pilot program underway in the Riverina in, um, in New South Wales to do exactly this type of work. Lastly, none, no talk on ecology these days would be uh, complete without some mention of, glo uh, of, of global warming. And of course, it is an enormous threat. It is, it is terrifying. What we know from the modelling that the IPCC has aggregated is that uh, El Nino and La Nina are likely to become a lot more frequent and more intense. Fire is likely to become more frequent, intense and larger and rainfall will decline across southern Australia. In fact, it already has. We can see it in our Malifowl data. Uh, rainfall on average, I think, has declined something like 30% over 30, uh, 30 years or so. I'm sure the farmers are well aware of that. Um, Alice Young in, you know, from the University of Melbourne and Perry Stenhouse uh, University of Adelaide are both looking into some of these effects. But I want to once again mention the importance of fragments here, uh, particularly in the context of global warming. Um, the fragmentation is, 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 is awful to look at, but at the same time it does have advantages. In particular, the, the small isolates are naturally protected from fire. It's, rel it's relatively easy to, to control invasives in a smaller patch. And of course, it's also, you know, bounded by agricultural land. There are all sorts of, you know, potential opportunities for revegetation, putting in food plants, you know, doing various things. The hardest is going to be gene flow um, for these isolates and perhaps one of the more important ones as well. But that's also solvable with wild sort of mound to mound egg translocations. So a summary, um, clearing control should be tightened, predators, we still just don't know what the story is. We need to clarify that and those experiments are underway. Fire, we're terrified of, you know, the future with larger fires. We need to reduce the scale of fires so easily said, so hard to do, it sounds silly to even say it sometimes. When it's blowing 45 degree, degrees and blowing a gale, you know, you ain't going to stop fires. Um, so we really have to start thinking, I think, about managing the fragments as well that are naturally protected. Habitat linkages, very important. And yeah, climate change, we need to have some sort of preparation. Lastly, I just want to, um, while there are grave concerns that I have, of course, concentrated on, you know, the declines, the predicted increases in fire and drought and, um, and herbivores and, and the isolation and that, there are also lots of reasons for optimism. Malifowl are still very widely distributed and that sort of speaks, I think, volumes to their toughness. They're adaptable, they're resilient, and they're incredibly tolerant of agriculture and trains, as it turns out. They do recover from, from you know, drought and uh, fire. And perhaps one of the biggest things for these, you know, tough as old boots birds is the enormous community interest um, and very capable labor source that, uh, is available to uh, to help in the conservation effort. And that's it. I wish that was my photo, but it's not. It's it's Graham Tonkin's amazing photo. Very quickly, just want to thank the NRM government and industry partners, all those voluntary citizen scientists, whether you, you know, whether you do the photo sorting or the, the monitoring or whatever, thank you so much. You're the backbone of all of this work and of course, to the many scientists. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joe. If you don't mind, I might ask our 
audience some um, if they've got any questions for you, if that's okay. Sure. Great. Has anyone got any questions on Joe? Down the front, bear with me. Yeah, Joe, it's Ashley from Ningen Station. How are you, Ashley? Yeah, good, thanks. Um, have you tried to investigate a Aboriginal regime of burning in that woodlands there? No, very good question, um, Ashley. I, you know, my experience with Aboriginal burning, you know, harks back to the time I spent in the Anangu Pichinjara lands. And at least my mopper there, the, you know, a traditional old um, Aboriginal man, uh, I would have trusted him completely, absolutely. Um, he knew what he was doing with fire. The problem, I suppose, is just trying to, to, to measure it. No, I'm, I'm, I'm quite a big fan of Aboriginal burning. So Thank in science, you. we need to measure things and measure responses. And uh, look, we could do it. We could do it, but it'd be a long-term program, of course. That's a good point, Joe. And thank you, Ashley. It was a great question. Any other questions in the audience? Oh, there you go. So, Joe, well, Dr. Malifau himself, thank you very much for joining us and all of those joining us online as well. Really, really enjoyed um, your discussion. And I think there's a, there's a bit more work to be done, isn't there? So if everyone could please put their, their hands together, please, for Joe. Thank you very much.